Okay, so I've been asked to talk about rare cardiomyopathies. Um, so I thought I'd go through the definitions first. So what's, what's rare? PFI hospital that makes money, that's incredibly rare at the moment. Politician doesn't change their mind. Perry on the number 63 bus, I think that's... <laughs> the ESC just sticking with the definition for more than a year, that's, that's pretty rare. And, and the blue moon, I'm just reading about that, that is, does exist, but it is, it is very rare. And then what, what's a rare disease? I looked look through all the definitions. That, that there isn't one. It, the dictionary says it doesn't occur very often. And there's no widely affected definition. Um, but, but I like this, because rare diseases in America, there's a one in ten chance you know someone. doesn't seem to make sense. But, but actually, if you think about it, it probably does, because there's a lot of rare diseases. And you think, oh, I can't be bothered to look for them. They're very rare. But as a group, they're very common. And I think that's the... One of the sort of messages for today, really, lots of rare diseases together become very common. So that's the rationale for, for looking for them. But Perry has shown the slide. So this is the definition of a dilated cardiomyopathy. So left ventricular dilatation and systolic dysfunction without abnormal loading conditions. So no hypertensive valve disease, coronary artery disease. So we, Sam will talk about myocarditis later. So that's an inflammatory process that can then produce a DCM. And another ESC definition, which is why we should all go for Brexit, I think. So hyperkinetic, non-dilated left ventricle. Yeah, so exactly. So that's just not quite dilated up yet, I think, probably. Okay. And this is important, particularly for the patients, actually. So dilated cardiomyopathy isn't heart failure. So this is the, the new... ESC definitions that Perry was mentioning. So, so heart failure, you've got to have symptoms and signs, and then it's split by ejection fraction. HEFMAREF is, is this week's latest definition. It'll be out by next year. And then for these where the systolic function isn't so bad, you've got to have peptides that are up at, and other criteria. So, so that's the definition of heart failure. And they are very different, and this is why it's important for the patients, because if they Google dilated cardiomyopathy, you just see you just see heart failure statistics. So if you look at people with heart failure, you come into hospital, if you look at three years, over 50% of them will have died. But this is people with coronary disease, average age is 79. If you look at dilated cardiomyopathy in the last decade up here, if you go out to nine years, it's about 90% freedom from death and, and transplantation. So they're completely different groups. And it's really important that your patients understand that because they'll read up and they'll think that they've got a 50% chance of dying in a few years. Okay, so you have your cardiomyopathy, you have your dilated heart. First thing to do is exclude coronary disease. CT does it very well. And MRI does it very well. So in the absence of high probability of coronary disease, they, they don't need an angiogram. You can have a CT or an MRI. And you have very good rule out values if you just look for ischemic scar. So that's the first step. And then that's where most people stop, and this is Perry's point, I think. So most people exclude the coronary disease, give the ACE inhibitor and beta blocker, and then stop. But, but you shouldn't stop, so this is a fairly elderly. But if you look hard, you, know, you can probably find a cause in about 50% of people, and there's lots of rare causes, but if you have a system and a structure to look for them, you can find that underlying cause in about 50% of people, probably. Okay, so wh why should we diagnose a rare disease? I think if you're going to focus... So I didn't know if that was right for a charity day. I sort of <laughs> asked Perry whether I could leave that in, Alison. I'm not sure. But, but, but why, why diagnose a rare disease? So there's a disease-specific treatment. That's important, lupus, things like that. It changes when you put your devices in, and we'll hear about this later and consequences for the family. So if you're picking which ones to really focus on, that, that should sort of perhaps be the top three reasons. And then you just need a system that you do in everyone. It's like, um, it's like a system for doing an echo or, or an EP study. If you have a, a protocol you go through for all the patients, then you'll, you'll pick these things up. So as always, history examination, it's the learning difficulties, deafness, cataracts, dysmorphology. These are all sort of red flags pointing towards underlying rare conditions. Neuromuscular symptoms and signs we'll hear about later. I think rheumatological symptoms and signs, the more I do, the more I think that's quite an important 
constellation of rare symptoms and drugs, illicit alcohol, all these anti-TNF treatments, I think they're an increasing cause of cardiomyopathies and clozapine and things like that. So, so, so look for those in the history and examination. In terms of neuromuscular disease, you'll have an excellent lecture very soon on that. But there's five main groups of neuromuscular disease when you're taking the history and examination. And cardiologists aren't very good at doing a full neurological examination, so I think you have to focus a little bit. But you're looking for myotonic dystrophy, you're looking for dystrophinopathies and limb girdle muscular dystrophies. If you just focus on that, they're, they're the only common three that affect the heart. So, so how they walk flexures, contractures, gait, that will pick up most of the overt neuromuscular symptoms and signs. So you've done your history, you've done your examination, and these are just the four next steps. So family pedigree, blood tests, look for arrhythmias, and some imaging. Okay, so you do your family pedigree. So, so um, esteemed members of the panel and Perry wrote a, a fantastic um, article, actually. I, it's the only one I've got that I really think, make a note of this, because it's a really, it goes through all the red flags, how to look for the rare diseases. It's, if you haven't read it, it's, it's well worth doing. But you're then looking at your pattern of inheritance and dilated cardiomyopathy. You're looking for the X-linked disorders that might push you towards a, a certain etiology. Blood tests. Some people do 100,000 blood tests, and I've, there's no, I don't know if the SC has come up with a, a DCM blood test panel yet, but it'll be, that'll be next year. But I, I think these are the ones I've, that people forget and that are useful. Sorry. So autoimmune profile, I think, does pick up things. Antiphospholipid definitely gets missed. Uh, CK, very rarely measured and, and very important. Again, HIV, and just a general inflammatory blood test. I've never found those useful, despite measuring them on 100 patients a week for, for 20 years. I've never picked anything up with those. I don't know, I don't know if anyone else has. So the, the next step is then looking for, for bradyarrhythmias for heart block. And heart block is perhaps the most important one in dilated cardiomyopathy for first degree, second degree, complete heart block. And if you have dilated cardiomyopathy and heart block, and again, this is back, you know, if, if you go to your EP colleagues, heart block is the ultimate diagnosis. That's it, heart block, pacemaker, go home. But, but particularly if you're young, there's often an underlying cause. Lyme, sarcoid, lamin. So if you're young with dilated cardiomyopathy and heart block, your chance of lamin is, is up to about 30%. Um, and then some of the other neuromuscular diseases. So it's, it's a really important red flag, heart block in dilated cardiomyopathy. And there's other ECG signs you look for. So this is the typical ECG of muscular dystrophy with these dominant R waves, um, right axis. And, and those big R waves often reflect this sort of postural scar you often see on their, their imaging. Okay. So you've done your, your blood test, your pedigree, you've done your ECG, your 24-hour ECG, and then imaging. Um, so your accurate volumes and function and sometimes scar pattern related diagnosis. So this is an iron loaded heart. So actually that's probably the commonest cause of DCM worldwide. But I think this is quite important. So if you do an MRI and they have normal coronaries, about 10% of the time you'll see ischemic scar. So that's embolus, in situ clot, microvascular disease. Um, and that's important because that would change how you manage them. Um, Sam's going to talk on myocarditis. Oh, what are, and this is the sort of typical subepicardial scar pattern you see. And I think because the, the endocardium thickens, you can have a lot of scar, but normal function, because it's the endocardium that, that gives you your visual ejection fraction. So, so, and I think the other thing with this is if you scan them very early, you pick up a lot more pathology. So we've started being much more proactive in scanning the myocarditis early. Okay, um, so what, what do you find in, in the normal population? So this is the European Cardiomyopathy Pilot Registry. And here, so if you look at dilated cardiomyopathy, um, a bit of Friedrich's ataxia, some mitochondrial disease. There's a lot more out there, but they're the ones that have come through on, on the registry. Um, you, you'll hear about children and adolescents later, but it's a slightly different pattern in children and adults. 
more myocarditis, more neuromuscular, and then you have these inborn errors of metabolism and things that, that we don't really understand, I don't think, to be honest. And if you break them down, I won't go through them all, but, but there's a whole series of things in the younger population that you look for, and there's a whole different protocol you can go through that I think we'll hear about a little bit later. And you can then, in that young, and I think, again, red flags, I think that this population does come through to the adult population, and when you're seeing sort of young adults, there's multi-system involvement, there's this patchy, weird scar, they're dysmorphic. You know, think about these other whole host of rare conditions, and there's a whole load of things that I think ammonia, lactate, CK, lymphocytes, and the white cells is a start, and then ask one of your, one of your colleagues to see them. Okay, just last few minutes. Th these are my top ten you know, you can't remember everything, um, and it's impossible to think of the thousand rare things, but I thought, what are the top ten we should try and think about and not miss? And this was my list, and everyone would have a, a different list. Um, I think lamin's important. Dilocalomorphy, heart block, you know, is it a malignant pedigree with lots of people dying in the family? Death with pacemakers in, neuromuscular science, in. and often very subtle at the early stage. And, and arrhythmias precede the cardiomyopathy, certainly by quite a period of time. So, so those that have the malignant arrhythmias, often their ejection fraction is normal. And actually, I think the average ejection fraction is about 50%. So they die with basically low normal ejection fraction. And they do the, the event rate, if you look at the, if you look at this, it's slightly old now, but about half the people will have sudden death or an appropriate shock. So it's a very malignant condition. So, if you pick it up, they should have a defibrillator. And you can see if you have three or four risk factors, and here are the risks, actually your outlook is, is appalling without a defibrillator. Um, so, so I work near a very big lupus center. I see more of this than most. But, but I think this is missed. And this group, often where you have the lupus and antiphospholipid together, that they present with a dilated cardiomyopathy, and you have to tease out which of these it is. So is it lupus myocarditis? Is it premature coronary disease? So they get their coronary disease 10 years before other people. They have microvascular infarcts. They have in situ thrombosis. And you go through this sort of series of CMR and geography biopsies. But if it is lupus myocarditis, it's a fascinating biological model. You watch the heart get better within a day or two. You give them the treatment and it normalizes don't understand why, but it's fascinating to watch. So, so think about that. Uh, Churg Strauss, I've seen a little rush of these recently. Um, speckled heart, lung changes, patchy, uh, late gadolinium, but high isinophils. Just look, look at these isinophils when you see these patients. Um, and I've seen quite a few of those missed. Um, ARVC, task force criteria. Um, and they're normally picked up, but, but there's this subtle left ventricular form. I think there's a big group of patients with mild dilatoconomy, a bit of disproportionate ectopy, so a lot of multifocal ectopy. And I think a lot of them do have desmosomal disease, even if they don't fulfill the criteria. And often oligogenetics so of the family is very subtle when you look. And they get these infralateral T-wave changes, they get lateral, postralateral, often quite small patchy scar on their MRI. And again, we'll hear about amyloid, but 10% of Afro-Caribbean heart failure is TTR amyloid. So it's you know, Afro-Caribbean heart failure, carpal tunnel. It's, again, big red flags to, to look for. Um, sarcoid is always missed, um, and it can do absolutely anything. So if you look at the MR scar patterns, ischemic scar, transmural infarct, um, myocarditis, ARVC looking, so it can mimic absolutely everything. I think we'll hear from Leon later today, but, but FDG PET is, I think, quite useful in this group. And you can see the active inflammation, but you can also see the nodes and other areas, and, and you normally get the diagnosis by biopsying the nodes or, you know, the endobronchial ultrasound and biopsies rather than the heart, actually. Um, tachycardia cardiomyopathy, normally AF, I, I think, you know, very, very treatable if you, if you just slow their rates, if you do the AV node ablation, whatever it is. But, 
which I think a big cause. Um, and that sort of overrides and overlaps with the Fios, um, the Takasubos. And I think this is missed. There's a, I read a paper last night. I think this is often missed. They're very paroxysmal. Just because their blood pressure clinic's normal doesn't mean they haven't got it. So I think, think about the Fios. Um, ectopy, if you have more than 10,000, can it do it? Sometimes, but, but, but think about that. Alcohol is important, particularly on a Friday. Don't forget your alcohol when you leave the conference centre. But, but if you do, alcohol and the, the AF related often go together. And if you have an alcoholic valid cardiomyopathy, if you don't stop drinking, you do really badly. But look, if you stop drinking, you do incredibly well. So again, another, another treatable cause. You're going to hear about neuromuscular disease, but, but dystrophin. So Becker's can present as a, a pure dilated cardiomyopathy. About 6%, probably less truthfully, of all dilated cardiomyopathy has dystrophin defects. So that's a... That one. Defendrick and non-compaction is, is the MRI doctor's nightmare, actually. Um, but this is how it compacts in utero. This is a... I think is probably a real case. But you get indistinct subvalvular apparatus, thin compact layer, these recesses and things. But there's a whole spectrum. And I've certainly got quite a few families just with apical trabeculation and non-sustained VT that seems to run through families. And I, I haven't seen that described in the literature, but we seem to be getting quite a, quite a few of those. And then I think it's the last slide. So mitochondrial disorders, um, often LVH to start with, then the DCM phenotype, maternally or Mendelian. Um, and I think the, the nuclear mitochondrial diseases are, are this big spectrum and they're not so well characterized and I think they're, they're definitely the ones we miss. But again, back to these things that should just trigger your, your red flags. Measure the CK, low anaerobic threshold often, muscle biopsy, MRI of the muscles as well. Okay, so that's just a, a brief overview. So, so rare cut them off these together are common. And it really is worth going to that next level in, in Perry's algorithm of how to diagnose cardiomyopathy. The red flags, just be aware of those. And I think this is important. You need a, wherever you work, you need a, a good relationship with your local regional center. The patients don't all have to go up, but you need some kind of ability to ask questions and have a dialogue with them. And the future probably is dialing in for the MDT's virtual working. Um, and have a structured approach to diagnosis. If you do it in everyone, it becomes routine and, and you don't miss things. Okay, thank you very much.